Hope you guys are good. Um, why don't you just uh, wake up somehow? I don't know, because I'm a little bit like drowsy this morning. Um, I'm not going to get you to stand or, you know, playing uh, play rock, paper, scissors or anything, but, you know, whatever can wake you up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. I uh, hope you're doing well. Good morning. My name is Yanku. Um, let me pray and uh, let's get going. Lord Jesus, thank you so, so much that uh, you love us. And God, thank you that you are in the business of restoring this world, of bringing people to you. Uh, wherever we are, God, uh, you love us deeply and uh, you are interested in us so much so that you gave your son uh, for us to make a way uh, to restore and reconcile us to you. And uh, God, I just pray this morning that, Lord Jesus, uh, your words would uh, penetrate our hearts. And God, Holy Spirit, may you do a deep work in us, in my heart, in all of us. Uh, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, may you do something that, uh, that I can't. And Lord, I just pray that you'd use me, and I pray that you'd, you would use us as a people uh, to, to just bring glory to yourself. Um, thank you that we get to be a part of that. Amen. Awesome. Uh, hope you guys are well, um, and uh, I've got the privilege of uh, keeping it short this morning. <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, uh, I want to share a quick story. Uh, hopefully that gets you awake too. Um, I enjoy running. Uh, I know my friend Dave also enjoys running. Um, I uh, grew up with a dad that, uh, I don't know, man, from a young age, got me to run like a 1K with him probably somewhere, and then it kept pushing it, you know, I was probably eight years old, uh, let's do a 2K, or hey, come on the bike, no doubt I don't really want to, uh, but he kept pushing me, you know, uh, I remember being like, I don't know, probably like four years old, uh, sitting behind him in the bike, because he wasn't running then, but you know, biking, I actually was behind my mom, and uh, my dad farted while he was running. And I was like, Dad, you need to say excuse me in Afrikaans. And he was just like, sheesh. But it's such a vivid memory that I have. I don't know. That's, you know, good. There you go. Good interaction. Uh, but I just remember my dad being a runner and him pushing me into that. And I really didn't necessarily love it. Uh, but the older you get, the more you start valuing certain things and you see wisdom. And uh, when we moved to Canada... Uh, something that the way we moved to Canada, I'll share on, was uh, middle of COVID, uh, literally Cass was thinking, we were thinking about moving, she was pregnant, it kind of jump-started the process of coming because we knew when the due date was, and then uh, Justin Trudeau announced and said, hey, listen, if you're a Canadian citizen living abroad, we were living in Africa, you should probably come back. Um, and uh, so we got her on a plane as soon as we could, I didn't have a visa, uh, God did a miracle, like this church actually prayed for us uh, while we were still going through all of that craziness, uh, anyway, ended up getting on a plane, wasn't supposed to be my plane, but it, I got it, so it was, I guess, um, arrived here uh, in Vancouver, couldn't get the connecting flight to Terrace, so stayed the night, and uh, realized there and then that they lost my, my baggage, my luggage, um, which I had packed in like a haste anyway. And so I literally had what I was wearing with like maybe, I think an extra pair of joggers or something like that. Um, stayed the night in van, got to terrace, self-isolated, all of that fun stuff. Sorry to, you know, bring you back to that space. Um, and uh, Cass had arrived a few days before me, so she was staying somewhere else than I was. I was in the backyard in an RV, and, uh, and then I was like, I should probably run, right? But they told us, don't go into the streets, stay home. So I was in the backyard doing like, trying to do a 5K with like no space. I still have my running Strava app with the like little circle. I'm pretty sure I did a 5K, so anyway. Um, but uh, then I was like, they said, oh no, you guys, you can start you know, going into the streets, but I had no shoes 
to actually run in. So I would go to like a school close by and run a 5K there. Uh, did that a few times. I was like, Cass, okay, I'm going to buy shoes because my baggage still hasn't caught in here like a month in. So we got some shoes. So that's, that's not these ones, but that's what I'm used to. I'm used to this, having this. I'm used to having a shirt and I'm used to having pants. Like that's what I grew up in Africa. This is all you need to run, okay? Maybe not even this, maybe that, you know? Um, and so, uh, but I started uh, realizing I had to adapt because that was March. A few months later, it started getting colder. And uh, I was like, sheesh, I'm going to be that guy that runs in the winter, you know, like, sheesh. And so I got, got the, long, the longs, I got the, like, beanie and stuff. I mean, I, you guys know what I'm talking about because you live here. But it was new to me, okay, sheesh. Uh, I got the... the um, for long johns, obviously, you know. I was contemplating wearing this this morning, but I mean, you guys get the picture. Um, and so I had to get these because it was starting to get cold. Uh, and then I got a running jacket, uh, and uh, little did I know it wasn't waterproof. So the first day I was running back from Cass's work to our house. And uh, it was pouring in terrace, and I was like, oh, it's fine, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be another one of those things I'm conquering, running in the rain with my rain jacket. Yeah, it wasn't a rain jacket, it's just a reflective jacket. And so that made me buy this, which is a rain jacket. And uh, anyway, it was really fun to test it out. And uh, reflective stuff, and you know, all the jazz, because it gets dark at like, you know, godforsaken, like, early hours of the morning. Uh, anyway, so that's been my journey of running in Canada, like that pile, um, because that's just the reality of doing life here. Um, but I was thinking that image came to my mind last week when Chris uh, started sharing, and uh, he, he, he brought us into Hebrews 12, verse 1, which is a, a kind of commonly used scripture uh, in Hebrews 12, where it says, Therefore, since we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight and sin that clings so closely and run with endurance the race set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so as he was reading this, I was just, the, the story of adapting to the Canadian climate, um, and maybe some of you are like, sheesh, you need all of that, you know, just go running shorts because that's what Canadians do. I know, I know, whatever. Um, but this image just came to me and I was like, your God, like there's something in that that you're stirring in me. And uh, we've been preaching through uh, kind of a series called, you know, ownership, stewardship, partnership. And uh, we've been touching on this thing of owning our faith. Like, do you own your own faith? Is it yours? Um, and uh, Chris has been touching on that over the last month or so, and uh, we looked at that last week again, and I was talking to Cass this week, uh, someone had sent me a podcast on uh, this guy down in Portland, uh, evangelical organization down there, that a f maybe a decade ago just felt like they needed to do something in the community, and uh, and it's just an amazing story of them going and approaching the leaders of the city and saying, hey, we've, we're the church, not just one, but the church, you know, kind of evangelical church in Portland. And they had said, hey, we want to serve. How can we serve? And uh, the mayor actually looked at them and said, hey, let's give them the worst school, you know, <laughs> in, the whole t in the whole town or city. And uh, they said, hey, do what this place needs some fixing, needs some loving. Um, and anyway, they stepped up and really just blessed that church, uh, that, that city in an amazing way. And uh, I was telling Cass the story, and what hit me was, man, I want those stories to come out of my life. What are the stories that are coming out of my life because of the faith that I have, the, the leading of the Spirit that's unique to me, or even my community? What are the stories of faith that we're owning that we can share? Because I feel like that's something that I sometimes fall into is living out other people's revelations or other people's faith stories. And it is inspiring 
and it should. You know, it should encourage us. Those testimonies should encourage us. But what are the testimonies that are coming out of us running our race of faith? And uh, where are we at this morning in that? And, and the beauty is that God is excited about creating those stories in us, wherever he's placed us. And so that's what I want to just touch on this morning. And, and, and maybe it is stuff that we've heard, but I, I just, as we were worshiping this morning, something that was just deep inside of me was like, God, I don't want to, I just don't want to recite stuff that I've written down. I want your spirit to move in this place, move in my life, and uh, challenge me to make decisions and make changes that are actually eternal and benefit others eternally. And so I'll share what I have here, and may God use it, and what shouldn't be used, may he just, me, remove it. So uh, we're in Hebrews 12, okay, and uh, the, the part that really struck me last week, and I feel like we need to touch on it again this week, and Chris said it was fine. Yes, thank you, Chris. Chris isn't here. Um, was Hebrews 12, where uh, it says, you know, we need to lay aside, we need to let go of anything that weighs us down or encumbers us from moving forward. And uh, I'm going to have some interaction this morning, okay? Okay. Uh, Maybe get some tips from the teachers here, um, where I need some crowd involvement, okay? So we're going we're gonna to learn some new Greek words, you know, because that's always fun, okay? So we're going to lead a pa, learn this word called apothemi. I don't know if it's the right pronunciation. It doesn't matter. It just needs to stick, okay? That just needs to stick this morning. So what I'm going to do is we're going to break it up because a whole word is maybe too much, Okay? I'll give you maybe a syllable or two, okay, to remember. So this section here, everybody, eyes on me, okay? You guys, you, this section here, Becky, I've got your eyes, hey, I've got your eyes, okay. Apa, apotha, I need you guys to be apotha, okay? Can you say with me, apotha? Apotha? Okay, apotha, thank you very much. You guys, easy, t, t, okay, just t, apa. Apotha, apa, the, themi. Hey, you guys can pronounce it. Themi, themi. You guys good? Can I hear themi, please? Themi. themi. You guys, what are you again? To. Wow. And you guys? Oh, uh, a path. A pa. Let's do a pa. A pa. Wow. Sheesh, guys. So good. Uh, beautiful. Okay. Again. Wow, sheesh, thank you guys. So that means literally to put out or take something away from its normal location and put it out of the way, okay? So just to, just to get rid of it. It was used literally of runners who participated in the Olympic Games who cast off their clothes and running nearly completely naked in the stadium, okay? Figuratively, the idea is to cease doing what one is accustomed to doing. Okay, to stop doing it, to throw it off, to be done with it. And so in today's life, uh, race of life, just like the Olympians, runners seek ad every advantage to win. We are called to shed anything that ties us to this world in a negative way. Picture us sprinting with unwavering determination towards the God, our ultimate destination uh, is Christ Jesus. The destination isn't uh, when we die only, we're not living for eternity, it's, uh, and that's the only purpose, is, hey, let's just get to heaven when we die. No, it's now, running towards Jesus now, running to his kingdom now, running into heaven now. Athletes, both uh, ancient and modern, understand the value of shedding weights during training to enhance uh, performance. Similarly, in our spiritual race, we need to identify and remove anything that slows our progress. Uh, so what are these weights uh, that we must dis discard to secure this victory of running towards Jesus? They include anything hindering our spiritual growth, even seemingly good things. And that's, that's what we touched on last week. It's not, is it a sin, as Piper the video we watched last week of Piper, he didn't say, hey, that's the lowest possible question. 
Is it sin? No, it's, is this helping me to run the good race? Does this enable me to run the good race? So we're looking at the laying off, the apart, the apothemi. Okay, we're looking at that right now, the laying down. And we'll get to the putting on part too. But the question isn't, hey, or is this a sin? Is this a sin? No. What hinders me? What hinders me? What hinders me in this life to, to run the good race? Um, much like successful athletes choosing between the better and the best, that's the question. Hey, what's best? What's best for me? Is this, is this better than what I currently have? Or is this bad? Like, that's not the question that professional athletes ask themselves. Is this bad for me? Well, if I'm asking that question, it probably is, okay? So that we, are, as, as spiritual athletes, that's what we should be thinking. Hey, how can this make me better? Um, how can this distract me, drain my energy, or dampen my enthusiasm towards this call that I have to follow Jesus? Paul advises Timothy, uh, and he says, hey, Good, shoulder, good soldiers travel light, okay? They're, they're light. They, they're not encumbered by the stuff that goes on around them. It says in 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, it says, No soldier in active service entangles, similar to a toe. What's it? Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, hey, let go of anything that entangles you um, and, uh, so that it can hold um, the person that they are called to serve. So don't get caught up in civilian affairs. Hey, focus on your goal, soldier. You're, you are called to fulfill the calling that you have been given, the mandate that you've been given. And so what are, what are some of these things that the rest of the New Testament focuses on? So if uh, we're going to look at the apart the themi stuff, there's a bunch of them that quickly, just so that we can keep getting this idea of how Jesus or the disciples, the apostles wrote about them. So in Ephesians 4 uh, verse 24, it says, throw off. So it is apothemi, that's the word used there in Greek. Throw off your sinful natures of your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So what do we need to apothemi? Old self, lust, deception, okay? Uh, Ephesians 4 verse 24 says, Therefore, having put away apart, okay, therefore having... Uh, Apothetemi, falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So, apothetemi, falsehood. Get rid of falsehood in your life. Colossians 3 verse 8, but now you must apothetemi, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. So get rid of that stuff. 1 Peter 2 verse 1 says, therefore put aside apothetemi, all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. So there's, there's too many. Like I'm not going to go through all of that, and that's not the point. But there is clearly this ongoing image of letting go of stuff, putting away, throwing that away, uh, and letting go. Each believer uh, must decide what burdens their spiritual journey. Each of us. There's no one-size-fits-all uh, judgment. There is clear guidelines to say, hey, these are the things that should be red flags if they're in your life. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, when sought, can swiftly and clearly reveal these hindrances to our progress in divine matters. And that's the beauty of His guidance. And it's also very, it's very specific, Right? If you feel a vague uh, discouragement, it might be the enemy's work. But if there's a specific hindrance that you're aware of, it is likely that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to let go of something slowing your spiritual growth. 
Maintaining a passionate spirit becomes easier if we're faithful in addressing habits and indulgent indulgences that clings to us, hindering our steps. Uh, many of us, I think, are like a boat that's just waterlogged. You know, uh, it's unable to really sink because we, we know what we have in Christ and we believe that, but we are weighed down by inconsistencies, worldliness, and allowed evils. So it's like this boat is still floating, but man, it can't really go anywhere because we don't want to deal with the stuff inside. Is there something in your life sapping your energy from holy pursuits, making you reluctant to pray or study the Bible, something causing uneasiness and disturbance? If so, even if others see it as harmless, it might be a weight you need to release. It might be something that you need to apothemi. If there is anything in your thoughts that you avoid exploring... So even as we're sitting here right now, you're like, I don't want to go there. I hope I don't have to deal with that. That's, that's exactly what we need to deal with. That's what I need to deal with. Is it something you argue with yourself about or consciously choose not to investigate? It's like treating a financial mess you'd rather not dive into. I'm not going to open the RBC app today. Uh, or ignoring signs of declining health for the sake of fleeting pleasures. Yeah, what's another McFlurry, really? Uh, I've been there. Uh, strangely, we often tolerate... I mean, the, the McDonald's reward system is just so tempting. That's how the devil works, man. That reward system. Started with iced coffees last summer, and now I'm here. <laughs> no. Anyway. Uh, sorry. Um... I lost my thoughts. Let's keep going. Um, so yeah, but it is true. Are we ignoring signs of declining health for the sake of fleeting pleasures? Strangely, we often tolerate ourselves in ourselves what we wouldn't tolerate in others. We're expert at finding excuses for actions we'd condemn if someone else did them. I'll just repeat that. Strangely, we often tolerate in ourselves what we wouldn't tolerate in others. And maybe if you're married, that, this one hits home. We're experts at finding excuses for actions we'd condemn if someone else did them. These things, be it an overtly consuming friendship, a draining habit, an alluring pursuit, or a captivating way, captivating way of spending time, can be weights. They act like a parasite sapping the energy of a fruit-bearing tree slowing down the soul's progress. It's like wanting to run, but being tempted to walk, or needing to hurry, but finding yourself lounging. And so I think that's the thing, is that for each of us, it's different. You know, some of us have gained muscles to be able to say, hey, I can watch one episode of Survivor, and that's it. Others, it's like, hey, let's binge some office, you know, whatever it is, because, and we have different levels of strength in areas. For some, it might seriously be a thing of, hey, I struggle when it comes to food. I struggle when it comes to just having space to lounge because I end up wasting the day away, or whatever it is. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and it isn't the straight answer of, is this sin? Oh, the, the Bible didn't say I can't, you know, game the whole day, you know, but hey, let's start thinking about it. What is the stuff that comes to mind that apothemi you need to do? You need to apothemi. And those, that's what the Spirit of God comes. And I think the, the devil can come and condemn us. And that's not the work of the Spirit. The Spirit says, hey, I want you to run. I want you to be free. I want you to enjoy. The devil comes and says, yeah, look at you. You suck. You can't do this. Look at you. You, sh you should be trying harder. You've, and you've tried already. Like, who are you? The Spirit of God says, I give you the strength. I want to walk with you. God says, you're my son. 
Jesus, Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son who did everything wrong. He lost his inheritance. And the response of the father was open arms and a feast. And the devil doesn't want us to enjoy that. So he keeps us down. Hey, you can't let go of that. God's not big enough to deal with that. You've been stuck there for decades with this thing. And the Spirit of God can come and heal and restore and give us something new and fresh. And he's surrounding us, He wants to surround us with people that want to walk with that and celebrate with us as we grow from strength to strength. And the world wants us to believe that, no, we should isolate. Go with people that can meet you where you're at. The Spirit of God says, hey, I want to make you the person that I created you to be and restore you into that place. So we need to apart the themi. Hmm. We should be even more willing to let go of anything that hinders us from gaining not just a temporary prize, but an enduring reward. This is an incorruptible crown. It is a reward that is kept for us in heaven. That we, we get to enjoy part of this beautiful promise now, but there is an end to eternity that we get to enjoy. This approval of God and like it's a huge well done from him. Uh, I was thinking about this and I remembered a preach and uh, I tried Google wasn't helpful here because I couldn't remember a lot. Uh, it was about this. There was a guy preaching and he had the picture that he threw up and it was a picture of a painting. So you guys have to, you know, imagine now with me this morning. Um, it was a picture of a little boy and uh, he had a toy in his hand and uh, and you can see he's been playing with it, other kids around, and uh, he drops this toy, uh, but you, can't, you don't really know why. Uh, just in the corner of this painting, there's a dove, and uh, he's opening his hands for the dove to come and settle. That's kind of the intent. And uh, the sermon was really about, hey, often we don't want to let go and make space for something better. And that's really this image. It's like saying, hey, I want you to apothecate me because I want to give you something better. Convincing people to release lesser things becomes easy when we see the chance to replace them with treasures shining in our lives of others or calling them the pages of Scripture. Sorry. The world might feel, feel sorry for what we let go of. But if we can see how much we receive, how much it's overflowing and how much it's generous and how much God we have in God, it would change our tune if we know what we're, what we're getting. And so that's really what we need to focus on. It's, it's not just let go, it's take on. What are we taking on? And that's the second Greek word this morning, which means to put on. It's N do O. Okay? N do O. So we've got N do O. Yes, you guys. I thank you guys for keep going strong, small crowd. Let's go N. Okay, N do O. Sheesh, easy. Okay, and it really just means the opposite, which is to clothe or to dress yourself uh, and to put on as a garment, to cause. Uh, to get into a garment. So, hey, get, put something on, really. That's what it means. Just put on, put on. Uh, it means to clothe oneself with something. Um, so just, again, some verses that we see and do O in the New Testament. In Galatians 3, verse 27, it says, For all who were baptized into Christ have Endued themselves with Christ. So have clothed themselves, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 24, and put on uh, enduo the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So we need to endure the new self and new self. 
Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 says, But since we are of the day, let us be sober. Sober, sorry. Having put on, so having, uh, so end to o the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Um, and then Romans 13, which is really great because it's a bit of both. It says that the night is nearly over. The day is almost done. So let us, eh, what's the first one? <laughs> uh, pa the <laughs> themi, apartha themi. So let us apartha themi the deeds of darkness and in do o oh, the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, in do o oh, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of flesh. Before Jesus can be visible in our lives, he needs to reside in us. So we can't just talk about this clothing thing. It really starts from within. He needs to reside within us. Grace does the magic. Putting Christ inside us and allowing uh, us to showcase him on the outside. So it's, it's an inner working. It's like lighting up a lantern. First you ignite the candle inside and then the light radiates out for all to see. So Christ needs to be in our hearts through faith before he can manifest in our actions through holiness. But we need to own it. It needs to be our faith. It needs to be us saying, I'm letting go, and I'm taking on, and it starts within. Once Christ is formed within us, becoming the hope of glory, there's no need to hide our love for him. Indeed, let's wear him proudly in our behavior as the glory of hope. Think of it as having Christ within us as our secret saver and then putting on Christ to make our daily lives beautiful. We can't fabricate this. And I think that's sadly, that's where things get warped. It's when we try and create a garment that only Jesus from within can produce outside of us in our actions. The stories that we hear like that story from Portland as an example, stories that we want to, we can't just create that. It's with an obedience of saying, Holy Spirit, come light within me the fire. And as I keep letting go of stuff and keep taking on more of you, may I become this beautiful lantern in my community. And that's what it says there in Romans is, is that's our armor of light. Uh, and it's such a privilege to be you know, in the army of God. Just as Christ nourishes our inner selves, let's clothe ourselves with him to cover our outward selves. So put on Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do that, you know. Uh, Let's turn to him for our daily dress. You know, we're talking about this thing of owning what we believe, owning our walk, um, owning our faith, and uh, as life groups, we've started this process of also just saying like, hey, what does it look like to practice these things practically? Because it's great to understand some of the theology of, hey, okay, it's a clearly a letting go of, we get some imagery of uh, athletes letting go of clothes so they can be unencumbered and we're taking stuff on. But what are some of the practical ways that in our culture, in our context, in my life, in your life, in your business walk, in your family, whatever it is, hey, how can we start practicing these things practically? And a Sunday is great for throwing out ideas, but we can't keep one another accountable much. It's just hard, you know. And so we have smaller communities that walk with one another and say, how are you doing? You know, one of the great things that I enjoy about running is running with someone because it's just way better. I can talk to somebody. Um, If they're a little bit faster than me or even if they're not, they're just keeping me accountable. I don't want to wake up today. Hey, see you in five minutes. Oh, oh, cheapers. You know, you're staying committed together because that's the goal. And the same way in our race, hey, we want to stay do this together. This is about doing life together. And uh, in life groups, we've been, we've been looking at what does it look like to, 
just start at the basics, which means being with Jesus, allowing his spirit to just come. What are some practices that we can do uh, as a community and keep one another accountable to those? And uh, grow in that. Go from strength to strength. Start, you know, with the 1K. And then build it up. And maybe the next day you just want to ride the bike, figuratively speaking. Um, But it's these baby steps, but accountability is beautiful. And a smaller space is also beautiful. Because, hey, you don't get missed. You know, when you're running with 100 people, it's pretty easy to just blend in or just fade away. And maybe no one will even notice. So I would encourage you to just join. Join a life group if you, uh, if you haven't. And uh, the, last, the last word that I want to finish with, and I'm, I'm almost done, famous last words, um, is Aegon. And uh, I'm not going to Aegon you guys, but it, uh, it's, it's the word that we have for race. And I just found it really interesting. It means uh, it refers to strife to bitter, sometimes violent conflict, Uh, exertion or contention for superiority, struggle for victory, contention, a competition, a contest, a race, a struggle against opposition. This is uh, the root word there. I'm not sure if you can, what English word you can think of when there's agon, agony. And so we are called to run a race that can be agonizing. And uh, that sounds daunting and doesn't sound great if we don't finish Hebrews 12 into verse 2, where it says, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one that brings us joy, gives us hope, makes our life better when we start looking at the, what he gives us, what he clothes us with, what he enables us with. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just want to encourage us to just fix our eyes on Jesus. And uh, when we start looking at all the things we should put off or put on and we try and do it in our own strength, then it, it is going to be way more of a thing that we need to fight for. We can't do this in our own strength. It's already, we're already fighting against things that sometimes our eyes can't even see or comprehend. There's spiritual, there's principalities, there's there's ways of uh, the world works spiritually that we don't understand and we need the Spirit of God inside of us to enable us to live in joy, to live in peace. And to have the strength to go out and say, God, I know I need you because if I don't, I'm not going to win this. I, I can't do this in my own strength. And uh, yeah, I just, just want to encourage you guys to, to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, um, to own it, and uh, to, to just you know, look at some of the practical steps, some of the things that this morning, I think the one big thing is what were where did your mind go when I said, hey, what are the things that you need to let go of? Because it's not just sin. It's what hinders me, what keeps my mind busy, what stops me from growing in Christ. That, I think, is the big one because we can't move forward if we're not in a space where we're saying, I want to run fully towards, towards Christ. And, uh, hey, join a community that is doing that already. Join a life group uh, even just say hi to someone. If this is your first time this morning, hey, we've got coffee and tea. Uh, we'd love to get to know you. Um, and uh, don't do this alone. And uh, if you need to talk to someone and just want some kind of help going forward, um, also, there's just people here that would love to do that. And uh, last thing, not in my preach, um, but uh, I just thought it would be a great opportunity, is uh, something that I've enjoyed at a personal level that I feel like has been part of my journey and my, where God has placed me has been uh, working with young people. Uh, that's what I did in uh, Bulawayo, in Zimbabwe, in Africa. And, uh, and so God's given me the opportunity to, to do that here in New Life and especially here in uh, Gwinnell in New Life, yes. Um, and so we don't have a program or anything of that nature that works with teenagers. And so 
the eldership has been great to say, hey, Yanku, come alongside us. And uh, if this is your heart, go for it, which I'm really thankful for. And it's also something I have a, a lot of, need a lot of faith for. Um, but I'm excited. And uh, just some, some steps. Where are we at with that? What can you pray for? How can you maybe get involved? Uh, right now, we're on like ground, not zero, but that sounds, it is probably ground zero, um, of, in the sense of like we're building up and uh, getting to know what God is doing with teens in the greater community of Quinal, because there are already people that have done this, that have established things, and they are reaching the young people. And so just getting to know those people, getting to see what God is doing through them, and maybe ways that we can partner with and come alongside and bring young people that maybe fellowship here to those places and just rub shoulders, that's where we're at. Uh, also, I think two, three weeks ago, Chris did announce this, that I'm stepping into this role, and I had like two people already approach me and say, hey, I'd love to get involved, and that's great because I'm connecting with those people too. So if you're, talk if you're sitting here and you've got a heart for teenagers, at, um, you can be any age, like I don't, it doesn't matter, uh, please chat to me because I'd love to just have a coffee together or chat, uh, dream together, pray together. Um, and then in the new year, we're really looking at just launching something that's really intentional for the, for the youth. And whatever that looks like, our heart is to just love, disciple, and make Jesus the main thing uh, of those times together. So eh, that's me, and I uh, hope you guys have a great week. Um, there's coffee and tea. Uh, I shouldn't forget about the chairs. If you can help us move the chairs, um, George or is here. I think, I don't know. He's downstairs. So anyway, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sam. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Yanki. That was great. Uh, yeah, so uh, have some coffee, tea, and George will be up after he's done with the Sunday school, and he'll organize it all. You can just uh, come and talk to him about uh, moving the chairs. So yeah. Also, I just wanted to, um, before we... I'll leave. I just want to say that there is opportunity if you need prayer to just come forward and, and we'll be happy to pray for you, pray with you. Uh, so whatever that your prayer needs are, we're here for you. So, okay. Have a good week.